Um, so my talk is probably maybe going to be slightly different from the previous ones. I'm really here to try to promote an understanding of what health psychology is and a very specific sort of area within health psychology, that of behaviour change and how it can feed into sort of our understanding and our treatment of chronic conditions. So just to give you an overview of my talk this afternoon, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what health psychology is. We're going to have a look at the health focus here in Northern Ireland and how health psychology and behaviour change can feed into some of the key targets for health that have been set out. Um, we'll have a look at what uh, theories of behaviour change are, some of the research that's ongoing at Ulster, um, what we would like to see as health psychologists, how we would like to see health psychology being introduced into sort of the health trusts, health promotion, public health in Northern Ireland. Um, using and drawing again on the Scottish experience, the Scottish seem to be leading the way in health care and certainly from a health psychology perspective their model is a very effective one that's being rolled out across the UK. Some general conclusions and then just some supporting evidence if you're interested and you might want to have a look at some additional documents on um, why health psychology is important for chronic conditions. So just to start off and maybe give you a little bit of information on what health psychology is. That is the, this is the British Psychological Society's definition of health psychology. They are our professional body as psychologists in the UK. So they see health psychology as an understanding of the psychological processes of health, illness and health care. The application of psychological theories and its research methods to the promotion and maintenance of health. The analysis and improvement of the healthcare system and health policy formation. And the prevention of illness, disability and the enhancement of outcomes of those who are ill or disabled. So it lends itself quite nicely to a lot of the research that's been presented this afternoon. The health focus then in Northern Ireland very much is focused in and around reducing health inequalities and promoting well-being in our population. Um, and many of the chronic conditions that uh, we have, and it's very prevalent within Northern Ireland and sort of contributes significantly to the health burden um, that's placed in our society, includes things like obesity, coronary heart disease and various forms of cancer. Now, if you look at those chronic conditions and you take into consideration their risk factors, there's common themes running throughout all of those risk factors. And certainly we've heard about some of those um, behaviours or health-related behaviours that can promote health and that can also be detrimental to health today. So very often for risk factors for chronic conditions, you'll see smoking as a very common trend across all of those. Certainly not um, you know, having a healthy diet is another one being very sedentary, which we've heard about this afternoon, not engaging sufficiently in physical activity levels as well, um, and consuming alcohol levels that are above the recommended intake. Now, these lifestyle choices are behaviours, so they can be changed, they can be modified, and they can be manipul manipulated in some way. And it was estimated that they actually, the care looking after people, people with chronic conditions, treatments for chronic conditions, take up about two-thirds of the health budget, somewhere in the region of about two-thirds of it. So it's quite a significant amount of money being spent on the management of these conditions. And a number of health psychology researchers are working in the area of behaviour change, which directly links to many of the risk factors on the slide. And again, just to put it into a little bit more into perspective for Northern Ireland, um, the health paper, Making Life Better, which encourages organisation of action in relation to behaviour change or areas that we need to target and consider more around six themes within that document. And I've just highlighted here some of the areas that health psychology and behaviour change could be instrumental in feeding into in relation to promoting health and well-being within Northern Ireland. So it's just to sort of give an overview of that. And you can see that we have the potential to kind of feed into all or to most of the main themes within that document. So leading on then to behaviour change. Well, really over the last number of years, there's been an absolute explosion of research trying to understand behaviour change in the area of health-related behaviours. So looking at health-promoting behaviours and looking at health-compromising behaviours. And we really have a good understanding of the processes that shape and regulate those behaviours. So we know that things like attitudes and beliefs. So if you have very positive attitudes about engaging in physical activity, 
from a very early age, you're more likely to engage in regular physical activity throughout life. So if you regard it positively, you know, you're more likely to actually take up those opportunities and engage. We know that past behaviour is also important. If you think of something along the lines of smoke and cessation, um, if someone has maybe tried to quit once, it might put them off for trying to quit again. We know from the research that's been done, it probably takes maybe four to five attempts before someone is able to actually give up. So it's managing that past behaviour and those expectations. Reflection as well is very important for any aspect of behaviour change. Again, we know from the research that has been done that if you're reflecting maybe on your health, you're starting to see some early signs of maybe symptoms like a persistent cough if you're a smoker, or you're starting to see signs of becoming slightly overweight and you need to do something about it. That reflection on your own health can have a, an impact on whether or not behaviour change techniques will actually be beneficial to you. Self-regulation. Again, how many of us have monitored our own weight? Marie, you were talking about monitoring sort of physical activity, step counts, if, we have, you know, if you've got a Fitbit and you're looking at your step count for the day. Again, these types of things can be used when it comes to behaviour change so that people can monitor their own progress and you can set them goals that they need to achieve on a daily basis. Social factors, being in family settings, peer groups, peer pressure. You know, very often our health behaviours start in primary school or late primary school, early secondary school. Your first cigarette might have been given to you by one of your best friends. Um, so we know uh, that that can have a big impact on whether or not we engage in certain lifestyles. And certainly some of the research that's been presented today on physical activity suggests that if you've got friends or you go with a buddy, you know, you're more likely to engage in regular physical activity if you have that relationship established. And of course the economics of it all. It's okay for me to stand here and say we need to, you need to eat a healthy diet, but if you're on a very fixed income, it's whether or not that is actually achievable for you and thinking about ways around that, planning um, and taking all of those things into consideration when you're designing and developing interventions for behaviour change. And again, over the last few years, a lot of the epidemiological research that's been done and large-scale European studies, we know that these behaviours are linked directly to mortality and morbidity rates. Um, so we, you know, there's an opportunity there for us as health psychologists to try to do something about that. Public health policies very often focus on a whole range of behaviours that need changing. So within public health in Northern Ireland, they will have streams looking at sexual health, streams for nutrition, streams on physical activity, streams on alcohol and drug abuse. So the efforts to meet these will really depend on the strategies and the interventions to modify behaviour that they decide to use. However, what is less clear is what is the best strategy to use. You know, and there's a number of things on the slide there that really need to be taken into consideration. And as psychologists, we know that one size doesn't fit all. So which one, which one of these interventions, which one of these strategies will produce the most cost-effective and beneficial effect for the, for the person that's being administered to? Who is it suitable for? Who's your target group? Who's more likely to respond to this? Is one group more likely to respond to it than another? And if so, why? What circumstances, how can we manipulate the environment, their attitudes, their perceptions, um, the social environment to actually promote behaviour change and to make that more effective? Psychologists or health psychologists can answer all of these questions. And they can achieve this really by employing theories of behaviour change. These are theoretical models which basically help researchers to understand those underlying factors that not only initiate behaviour but also promote, maintain it, and we can manipulate those factors in order to change it in some way. So models of health behaviour can also help to identify appropriate methods to change um, related behaviours. On this slide here, I've just put up one or two of the main theories within health psychology that's used to kind of change and promote some of those behaviours, those key behaviours that are key for the development of chronic conditions. So the theory of, of planned behaviour, self-determination theory, um, and the COMB model are some of the most sort of prominent um, models of behaviour change that are around in the literature today. 
So what are the benefits of using these models of behaviour change then? Well, they do provide us with a way of looking at those underlying processes that facilitate, prevent or maintain a particular behaviour. So they have an understanding, or they can help us to have an understanding of the causal mechanisms in and around the behaviour. And if you have an understanding of that, then it makes it easier to change and manipulate it in order to bring about more effective behaviour change. Um, so they provide us with frameworks for doing research and intervention design. And the example that I've given here in the slide is the theory of planned behaviour, abbreviated to TPB. So there's a very clear structure in relation to how you would go about designing an intervention using this particular theory. And the first thing that you would do is you would conduct an elicitation study. And this usually takes the form of focus groups, interviews or open-ended questionnaires, trying to elicit the sort of the key beliefs and attitudes around a particular behaviour, whether it's engaging in the 150 minutes of moderate physical activity, um, you know, is a good example of that, or some other health-related behaviour. And from that information, from the themes that you would generate from your qualitative piece of research, you would develop and design items which would form the basis of a, a questionnaire which would be given out to a larger sample. So you would do a large-scale survey. And using both of those pieces of information and looking at predictors of that particular health behaviour that you're interested in, that would give you ideas of what you need to target and how you would design and pilot an intervention. The TPB in itself has been recognised for a number of years now by NICE as being one of those theoretical frameworks and models that is key, really, to, de to um, designing key interventions for behaviour change. And as health psychologists, we're always constantly trying to improve our uh, methods and the way that we do things. And one of the issues and problems with a lot of interventions that have been designed and reported on and evaluated in the past is that they don't describe the key components terribly well. So are you monitoring behaviour? How are you doing that? If you're problem solving, what exactly does that entail? Um, and there has been a development there in relation to the behaviour change wheel and the taxonomy of behaviour change. And basically those are descriptions, sort of standardised descriptions that make up components or potential components of an intervention. And again, it's all to do with sort of replicability and building an evidence base to support um, the models. And then just to give you a sort of a, an overview of some of the research that's currently ongoing at Ulster, um, under the sort of the key headings of some of the uh, main theories. A lot of these projects have been funded PhD projects, but one or two of them uh, have been funded elsewhere. We're currently doing one using the theory of planned behaviour, looking at e-cigarette use, um, attitudes and perceptions of it in children and adults in Northern Ireland. And that has been funded by Chest, Heart and Stroke NI. And another one, which is in conjunction actually with Marie, is the Walk With Me study and other colleagues at Queen's. Uh, that's a peer walking led intervention specifically aimed at sedentary older adults with chronic conditions. So looking at ways that we can promote walking and sort of some form of physical activity in those people who um, previously really wouldn't have engaged in any forms of physical activity. And that's an NIHR um, funded project. What do we need um, or what do we feel we need as health psychologists and behaviour change experts? Well, I think it's only fair to point out that we're the only devolved nation in the UK that doesn't actually have health psychologists working in health trusts here in Northern Ireland. Throughout the rest of the UK, they do have. They're contributing to health policy, health promotion, clinical settings where you have people experiencing chronic conditions that require lifestyle changes. Health psychology is inputting and impacting um, and informing those particular practices. So I think we need a greater awareness of what health psychology is. Um, the use of health psychology methods, as I've said, to inform policy and practice in public health and healthcare services in Northern Ireland. Um, health psychology posts in the NHS Health Trust would be fantastic. Um, and certainly funded training opportunities um, if anyone was interested in doing stage two training in health psychology to be a practicing psychologist in that area. Um, and placement opportunities for those trainees. So we're really looking for uh, public health opportunities within the health trusts 
to sort of feed into some of your programmes and to, to sort of help with that and also to give trainees experience of what it would be like to work in a healthcare setting. And better training in behaviour change, I think, for um, people like nurses, doctors and other allied health professions because they're on the front line with many of these chronic conditions. So having a better understanding of how they can help their patients and promote better health and well-being. Again, sort of drawn on the Scottish experience and, and using it as an example, NHS Education Scotland has really recognised the importance of health psychology um, to the NHS for around about 10 years now. So they have had health psychologists um, within their health trusts and they have a plethora of trainees sort of going through on a regular basis each year as well. So they have jointly funded training posts with the health trusts to fund health psychology doctoral training. What the health trusts have got back from this is that health psychologists have helped them achieve their HEAT targets and also provision of local plans for health care as well. And just thought I would put up some of the projects that uh, some of the trainees and health psychologists have been involved in um, in the Scottish health system. So promotion of breastfeeding, oral health in children and sexual health promotion. Um, Again, there's other benefits. It means that um, there's a sharing of best practice. It's a multidisciplinary experience. I'm not suggesting that health psychologists should replace health promoters um, or consultants or nurses or doctors, but it's a sharing of best practice. It's done in a multidisciplinary way. And it's linking experts in health psychology, health boards, and the different universities across Scotland. It also provides a key opportunity for networking and stakeholder engagement. So the message is getting straight out there to the people that need it most. And you're getting feedback from those people. Do they find it beneficial? Is it good for them? You know, it, it's a two-way process. It also provides an opportunity to develop behaviour change research and an evidence-based sort of at a local level. So they're able to say, this intervention worked in this setting for this group of patients, and it may well work in another setting for another group of patients. There's also a certain amount of continuity in care because people are in posts long term and they're also training. So there's a constant sort of flow um, of people coming through. And two areas that have sort of been highlighted that health psychology has been key in shaping within um, the health service in Scotland is shaping care for older adults and developing psychological capacity um, in care workers. So just to sort of finish off, so the take home message really is that most chronic illnesses are linked to lifestyle choices. Most of these lifestyle choices are behaviours that people engage in willingly and they can be changed. There's a potential then really for behaviour change and health psychology to impact on public health, improving health in Northern Ireland and improving health promotion and intervention design. Health psychologists are experts in establishing factors that are influencing health behaviours, and developing more effective interventions to change this behaviour. They also have experience in evaluating these interventions, reviewing them, and um, you know, deciding what needs to be changed for the next time round. And then just on this slide, um, it really provides some additional information on national service frameworks um, that really have provided evidence of the need for psychological services in the chronic conditions on the slide, if anybody's interested and you want to have a sort of a more in-depth look at that. Okay, thank you.